Well, the Chicago White Sox may have started off with a one and four record, but they've since rebounded and are one of the hottest teams in baseball at seven and four. They'll host the Milwaukee Brewers tonight at 710 at Guaranteed Rate Field. You can listen to my guest call the play by play action of the White Sox games on WGN 720 AM. And he also happens to be a graduate of Bradley University, Andy Mazur. Andy, thank you so much for being on the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, go Braves. Obviously, you have spent that time in Peoria first as a student at Bradley University. If I may take you back to that time, what, what were your years spent on the Hilltop like? Well, you know, it was a lot of fun. Uh, first time, obviously, experiencing life away from uh, from home and from mom and dad, which was kind of liberating at times. It was interesting at times having to deal with my own uh, situations rather than being able to to call and ask somebody for uh, help or whatever. But uh, you know, I had a great time. I uh, I really I'm glad I chose Bradley. Uh, I was not what you would say a model high school student. I got by on uh, hopefully good looks and charm or uh, just a, a good way to fake it. But you know, being at uh, being at Bradley and getting to know professors and getting to know people uh, on a on a big level, you know, at a much more deep level than you may have at a bigger school. Uh, I mean, I still keep in touch with uh, with many people that I went to school with, and even many people that instructed me. So it's uh, it's, a, it's kind of a lifelong thing after you graduate from Bradley. What would you tell people that may be considering Bradley looking at it from the perspective of where you're at today? Yeah, you know, you guys, if you're, if you're interested in going to Bradley as far as uh, going to communication school, your options are a lot better now than they were when I was there. Uh, everybody should be sending us thank you notes for being able to pay for the, uh, the brand new Global Communication Center, although it's not brand new anymore, but uh, new to me at least. And... Uh, yeah, we kind of had to, to scrounge for ourselves while we were down there. We, we figured we were in all, and I say we, because there's a bunch of us that are up here in Chicago too, uh, that, uh, you know, we found stations to go to. We found things to, to work on in the market, which was fantastic because it's a, it's a good market to start in. A lot of people wish they could get to this market uh, in Peoria to, you know, to culminate their careers. So felt pretty fortunate to, to be able to start there. Uh, but, you know, right now there's, there's a wealth of, of things available to you. Uh, and a lot more than it was available to me before, not just with the communication school, but also with the different forms of media like we're doing right now. I mean, you could do a, you can do a podcast uh, on Zoom. You can do a podcast, uh, whatever host you want to have. You can do your own thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's so much more liberating now and so much, there's so many more opportunities to get your work out there than there were back in the day. And the, back in the day, it wasn't that long ago. So you, know, you can only imagine what's going to happen you know, five, 10 years from now, we'll be talking, I mean, I don't know, who knows, we'll be talking holograms at that point. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I love the fact that you can go to a good school, get a great well-rounded education, uh, get that personal attention that you probably uh, need at that point. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I would, I would highly recommend Bradley. Your time in Peoria, obviously wasn't just on the campus. You also spent some time at the radio stations, WMBD, and what's now called 93.3 The Drive. Could you kind of tell us what your experience was like on the radio waves of the Peoria market? Yeah, well, you know, it took a little time to get there. Uh, this is, again, we were sending out resumes at the time, no tapes, because I didn't really have a tape to send out, but looking for internships my sophomore year, and I got a response from one station, and it was WMBD, and they basically said, uh, no, you're too young, uh, we'll keep your you know, application on file, and blah, 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 you know, you hear that all the time, and you never think they're going to follow up on it, but I give them credit. They followed up on it the uh, the next semester, my first semester of my junior year. And I wound up doing an internship there at the radio station for their morning show. And basically, I never left. It was uh, one of those kind of things. It was kind of like an infection. You know, I just kind of spread my wings in there and they, they couldn't get rid of me. Uh, at one point, I had four different time cards for part-time jobs in that station. I had uh, an on-air shift on the weekends on WMBD, 1470. Then I went across the hall and did... Uh, top 40 on KZ93 at the time. I would write copy uh, for commercials, and I also would floor direct for the uh, Channel 31 television newscasts, which were also down the hall. So I would have a full day. I mean, I would start uh, you know, 10 a.m. at uh, 10 to 2 on WMBD. I'd go 2 to 6 on KZ93, and then I'd rock down to the newsroom uh, after their 6 o'clock newscast, and I would uh, floor direct the 10 o'clock cast. So I was, you know, I was there for 12 hours. Uh, getting paid diddly, but uh, some of the best times of my life when some of the greatest people I've ever met uh, were during that time. So it was a lot of fun. I want to go a little further in your career with now with the Padres at that one point. 
what was it like filling in for somebody like Dick Enberg? And what was it like just being around a broadcaster like him? Obviously, people in the industry know how revered he is and within the Padres family as well. Yeah, and you're too young to remember the 1985-86 season for the for the Bears and the Super Bowl in uh, in New Orleans was actually called by Dick Enberg. And Dick Enberg and Merlin Olson were the two guys that were on the call uh, for that game. And I'll never forget that because I, I, went, I drove down to Bradley early from – from the winter break to, to get back down to watch the game with a bunch of people that I had met. So uh, to kind of be able to rub elbows with a guy like that was pretty, pretty cool. Um, the fact that he had actually heard me in San Diego before uh, he came to the Padres, I'd already been there three years before he got there. And knowing that he was listening to some of my basketball games, he was the voice of UCLA basketball during the heyday of the John Wooden era and the Lou Alcindor, later Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton and all those guys. So to think that uh, you know somebody like that had actually heard my work and was still willing to talk to me made me feel pretty good about things. So uh, yeah, there was never any lessons or anything like that that you know he would ever take me aside because by that point I'd been in the business for a while. I was working for my second big league team and he knew that. And I, I think he just uh, he respected me for what I did and I certainly respected for uh, him for what his career brought. And uh, I mean it was just weird to wa- see him walking down the hallway or, or saying hi to me and thinking. And you called the Bears Super Bowl. This is pretty cool. So it was, uh, it was, that was kind of how our relationship was. You've also spent time with the Cubs and the White Sox, obviously now full-time on the radio for play-by-play for the White Sox. But what has it been like being professionally around the two pro baseball teams in Chicago, being somebody from the Chicagoland area? Dreams. I mean, it's a dream come true. I mean, if you can work in your hometown, you don't have to move. You know everybody here. You know the lay of the land. Your family's here. Uh, friends from as far back as grade school are still here that I talk to. So uh, it certainly makes it a lot easier to, you know, to manage. And it, it's two teams that you know a lot about because you grew up here. So uh, even if you grow up one fan, uh, a fan of one team and not the other, you still know about the other because they're in your city. So, I mean, it, it, it works out pretty well. Um, you know, it was great. Uh, it was great getting in with the Cubs when I did. Um, there were not a lot of winning seasons. Yeah, there was the one in, in 2003 that I was a part of. But what it did for me there was it taught me a lot about the industry and about sports broadcasting and about, uh, you know, being a good partner on the radio, uh, being a, a diligent worker, trying to break stories, trying to forge relationships with players. Uh, and I was young in the, in, the, in the game at that point. So, you know, some of my earliest lessons of what to do and what not to do were formed there. And it really prepared me for going to San Diego and now coming back here to work on the South Side. And I, I wouldn't trade any of those experiences for the world. I mean, uh, my boss there, Dave Ennett, was uh, smart enough to hire me there and then smart enough to hire me back. I give him a lot of credit for that, by the way. Uh, uh, one of the best people I've ever worked for in my life. But, you know, those were the kind of great days because he would let you do your thing. And he never really nitpicked. He never met, micromanaged. Uh, you know, I was kind of on my own. I learned, I learned a, you know, a routine on my own, which was, which was great because – you know, it's changed over the years, obviously, but uh, you have to have a baseline. You have to have a, a starting point to, uh, you know, to have that uh, way to prep and way to uh, get ready for a game. So those were uh, some great lessons that I learned early on. It also allowed me to become uh, friends with uh, with guy like Ron Sano. I mean, it was, uh, you know, a guy that I had, had known quite a bit about, obviously, when I was growing up in town here. And I kind of knew I was onto something big when my dad met him for the first time. Uh, brought him up to the broadcast booth at Wrigley, and my dad, who is usually you know very confident, very uh, speaks a lot, uh, was kind of tongue-tied a little bit and was in awe. And I thought, hmm, first time I've ever seen that, so this must be a pretty big deal. And I just knew him as Ronnie. He was my buddy. You know, he was my guy that uh, that I hung out with and worked with. So you know, it taught me a lot about how to deal with people like that as well, and not deal, but how to treat people like that as well. And Uh, You know, I miss that guy to this very day. I miss a lot of the people that I worked with that have passed, you know, so Jerry Coleman in San Diego, Tony Gwynn as well, and and now, of course, Ed Farmer. So there's been a lot of guys that I've been around that I feel pretty fortunate to have been around. I'd be remiss if we didn't mention Ed in this interview. What have you seen from him both while he was still with us and now since he's passed, how much he meant to the White Sox family? Because I'm just a kid that broadcasts some high school games in central Illinois, but I just loved listening to Ed Farmer call a baseball game. What was it like from your perspective? Well, so I I got to know him really well the last couple of years. I I knew, I knew him before he knew me before, but we had never really been formally introduced and everything like that. But 
when I was with the Cubs, we came over to Guaranteed Rate Field. I think at that point it was called U.S. Cellular. Uh, and it was a really warm afternoon on a, on a Sunday. And Ron Sano on our broadcast crew obviously had suffered from diabetes and was really – we had really had to keep a close eye on him when the temperature got hot because his blood sugars would go crazy. And, you know, Ed came down to our booth uh, and really made sure that Ronnie had everything that he needed. He gave him a Coke. He gave him a Snickers bar. So if he had a sugar, a sugar attack, he could at least, you know, have something close at hand. He kind of came in to make sure that we knew where the air conditioning controls were we, and, and things like that. I mean, it was, it was amazing to me to watch a guy take care of somebody who was working for the other team the way that he did. And I never forgot it. And I, me- I remember mentioning it to him when I first officially met him in 2018. And he kind of looked at me with this face that said, so that's that's how you treat people. That's kind of how you do it. And so I didn't I didn't do anything out of the ordinary. I did what I'm what I'm put on earth to do. And as I come to find out, you know, over the last couple of years uh, of getting to know him and traveling with him and and being around him quite a bit was that was exactly who Ed was. I mean, a very generous and genuine human being who uh, and I've said this story a million times and I'll just say the anecdote one more time. You know, he was the kind of person that would give you the shirt off his back and then be upset that you didn't ask for the shirt because he really wanted to give it to you. So, I mean, we, we miss Ed a lot. I mean, he and Darren Jackson were very good friends, not only just broadcast partners. Uh, they, were, they were very close. Their families were very close. And, uh, you know, sitting in that booth right now, it does feel a little empty, not just because there's no people in the stands, but it just feels weird not being uh, with Ed in that booth because that's all I've known uh, since I uh, became uh, part of the White Sox with, with WGN Radio. Um, you know, we're, we're moving forward as, as best we can. We're honoring Ed every chance we get. Uh, we're talking about Ed every chance we get. The White Sox are wearing a patch that says Farmio, uh, and that just gives you an idea how much he meant to the organization growing up on the south side that he did and uh, being able to go to games as a youngster at the old Comiskey Park and then getting a chance to pitch for the White Sox, going to the All-Star game with them, and uh, then coming back and being a broadcaster. I mean, he lived, he lived the life. I mean, a, a guy that grew up on the south side, all the boxes were checked off for him, and uh, it's just unfortunate that he's not around to see what this team is becoming. And boy, what this team is becoming is definitely a sight to behold. What has it been like calling games for such a playoff hungry, such a hyped up, almost seems like a refreshed White Sox organization? Yeah, you know, we never knew what to expect in this crazy uh, you know, pandemic shortened season with 60 games. You know, nobody knew what to really expect about, you know, what do you get off to a hot start? Do you have time to recover? Well, I guess the White Sox are showing you do have time to recover, uh, getting off to the one and four start, like you mentioned. But now, Having won six games in a row and uh, being three games over 500, it's pretty good. I mean, uh, and they're, they're a fun team to watch. I mean, they've got a lot of young talent that's they're really interspersed with some great veteran leadership, uh, which is always something that you need. Uh, Dallas Keuchel pitching tonight, you know, a mainstay in rotations uh, from Houston to Atlanta and now here in Chicago. Uh, Asmani Grandal, a great catcher. I was with him in San Diego when he was a rookie. Uh, and I'm, it's amazing how much he's evolved since uh, since the 2012 and 2013 seasons when I saw him at first. Um, but, you know, Edwin Encarnacion who's hurt a little bit now. But, you know, you've got guys that uh, have been through the wars before and are trying to teach the younger guys like Eloy Jimenez and Luis Robert and Nick Madrigal and uh, everybody that, uh, that's involved at, uh, at a young age how to win. And, you know, the, the glue to tie it all together is the, is the manager, Ricky Renteria, who I've known for a while. We go back to our days in San Diego as well. He was a bench coach and first base coach down there while I was in, uh, in San Diego. And I know how much he wants to win. And I know how much Rick Hahn wants to win. I know how much Jerry Reinsdorf wants to win. Uh, and it doesn't matter that it's coming in a 60-game season because, as somebody said, if they're going to hand out a trophy and uh, rings at the end of the season, why not win it, right? So they're, they're trying to do that. Sox pulled the mini sweep of the two games at Miller Park. For fans of the podcast, Andy and Darren Jackson on the call tonight, 7-10 first pitch. Now from Guaranteed Rate Field, what are your thoughts on where the team's at through this shortened season, through those first two games in Milwaukee as well? Yeah, I mean, I like what I've seen. Uh, you know, uh, they're getting some good, better starts from the, the top of the rotation. Still need to get some, some better starts from the lower end of their rotation, though it's been a little bit of a flux because of injuries now with uh, Reynaldo Lopez on the shelf and Carlos Rodon on the shelf for a little while as well. We're not exactly sure who's going to replace uh, Rodon in the, in the rotation yet, but, but certainly uh, 
Lucas Giolito and uh, Dallas Keuchel have been uh, have been great, but the bullpen has been spectacular. The bullpen uh, has far exceeded anything that we have expected uh, them to be coming into the season. Uh, you know, at one point they had an 18 inning scoreless streak going, and uh, they got a guy in Ross Detweiler, I think, who's retired 20 of the 21 batters that he's faced, and has still faced the minimum because uh, a double play came after uh, he gave up his first hit. So there's a lot to like as far as the pitching staff is concerned. The offense is scoring runs. They're scoring them in bunches. They're scoring them early in games. They're scoring them late in games. They have the ability now to come back. They've done that the last couple of nights uh, in Milwaukee with uh, game-tying homers and then clutch hits by Jose Abreu. So, uh, yeah, it's been great to watch. I mean, they're fun. They're fun to be around. I mean, not that we're around them, unfortunately, because we can't be. But uh, when I say around, I mean just, you know, broadcasting these games because it's just uh, it's fun to watch them gel. One final question before I let you go. You mentioned Dallas Keuchel on the bump tonight. What We know how good of a ground ball pitcher he can be. That's something that if you've watched White Sox games, you know that's part of his repertoire. What sort of things are you looking from him and the White Sox, both for Keuchel's third start and to hopefully take three out of these four mini series from the Brewers? Yeah, I think just, you know, kind of doing what he's doing. I mean, he uh, he's a workman. He's, he's precision. Like, I call him Dr. Dallas Keuchel a lot of times because – he goes through a lineup surgically. You know, it's, it's one of those kind of things where he will not give in to a hitter. So he'd rather walk you, face the next guy, and start over again, knowing that he can get you out, uh, rather than giving in on a, on a, a hitter's count to a, a slugger and get hurt. So, you know, he's smart. I mean, he, he operates very smartly. He uh, w- would not uh, threaten any records as far as how, how hard he throws the ball, but it just shows you that that really doesn't matter. If you're locating your pitches, if you're uh, in tune with your catcher and, and pitch sequences and, and keeping hitters off balance and keeping them guessing, you can win a lot of baseball games in Major League Baseball, and he's proven that he can do that over the, over the years. Uh, Cy Young Award winner in his past and uh, not a bad little run with uh, Atlanta, though he signed late last year and, and now uh, reaps the benefits of that uh, with, uh, with the White Sox here with a, a nice long contract. He's lived up to it at this point. Uh, I like watching him throw. He, you know you're going to get a professional performance from him every time he goes out there. He may not have it every night. No, no pitcher ever does. Uh, but, uh, but you certainly have a better feeling knowing that he's going when you go to the ballpark. All right, folks, when we come back, more Major League Baseball conversation. But for now, we say so long to the radio voice of the Chicago White Sox and Bradley University alum, Andy Mazur. Andy, thanks again for being on the show. You got it. Thanks for having me. Take care.